Hello everyone and welcome. In today's video we'll be discussing complete control. Specifically, the differences between each of the series. If you're researching to get into the native instruments environment, hopefully this video will help you make a more informed decision to what best fits your needs. I'll be going from high to low, as that's how they were released. The S series was released on October 1st, 2014. At this point in time, they only had three sizes a 25, 49, and 61 key. They all had semi-weighted keys, however, the 25 key did not come with aftertouch. In late 2015, they released the S88, which was a fully weighted key keyboard. Other than the differences between the Fadar keybeds, every button and feature was the same. They featured touch strips instead of pitch and mod wheels, a light guide to differentiate different zones on a patch, eight encoder knobs to browse patches and libraries, and to adjust parameters, DAW integration, and transport controls. In mid-2016, Native Instruments took the visually disabled community by storm. With the release of complete control access with speech, companies could now use NKS, or Native Control Standard as it's known, to map parameters to the complete control keyboard, in turn making it accessible. In late 2017, the MK2 versions of the S49 and 61 were released, with the S88 being released in the latter half of 2018. These new iterations featured USB bus power, deeper DAW integration, physical pitch and mod wheels, a brand new assignable touch strip, eight brand new context-sensitive function keys at the top, a better light guide, two high res resolution screens, transport controls, deeper integration with Native Instruments machine software, and many more features. Please note that there is no S25 Mark II. For reference, we're currently in the middle of 2023. When I reference the S series, I'll be focusing on the MK2 iteration, as this is the latest version that Native Instruments sells. Alongside the release of the S88 MK2 keyboard in late 2018, the A series was introduced as well. These are entry-level keyboards ranging in size from 25 to 61 keys, with a reduced feature set that I'll get into now. The first thing you may notice is that the keybed is different. This is no longer a Fadar keybed. Instead, you get a synth action keybed. At this price point, they did away with the light guide, the touch strip, the dual screens, and some extra functionality including the function row at the top. However, the core functionality remains the same. You still get your eight encoders. However, navigating your library and patches is different. More on that later. You still get transport controls and some DAW and machine integration as well. In early 2019, they released their M32 keyboard. This keyboard was geared more towards the mobile producer as it was compact and lightweight, making it easy to travel with. The A series and the M series are exactly the same with these three differences. First, you have pitch and mod strips. Second, you have a lighter synth action keybed with less travel and smaller keys. And finally, because this is a smaller keyboard, the key layout is more compact. Otherwise, it looks exactly like an A series. Generally speaking, when I refer to the A series, assume the same thing can be done to the M series unless I say otherwise. I'll now give a description of the S series keyboard. I'll start with the rear panel. With the unit lying on a flat surface in front of you, the keybed should be facing towards you. From left to right, the power button. In means on, out means off. A USB bus type B standard, AC power input, a quarter inch expression pedal jack, a sustain pedal jack, MIDI in, MIDI out, and a Kensington lock slot. The top of the unit has nice rubber buttons arranged into groups. As you can hear, these buttons aren't that loud. These are located on the upper part of your keyboard. The lower half is dedicated to your keybed, with your mod and pitch wheels and assignable touch strip on the left. Above that are three buttons in a row. From left to right, they are fixed velocity, octave down, and octave up. You can use shift in conjunction with the octave buttons to move up and down by semitones. So let's move back to the upper half of the keyboard and go through these buttons together. Firstly, however, to turn accessibility on, you hold shift and press the mixer button. Shift is the extreme upper left, and mixer is the extreme upper right. I'm going to go ahead and press those now. You didn't hear anything. On my end, it said accessibility on and my default TTS voice. So what do these buttons do? Well, there's a training mode we can invoke by pressing shift twice. And now we can press any button to find out what it does. What you just heard was the first group of six pack of buttons on the upper left hand side of the keyboard, minus the shift key. Each of these buttons are arranged in two rows of three, one above the other. The next group of six below that are... Loop. Metronome. Tempo. Play. Record. Stop. Keep in mind that holding shift while pressing some of these buttons may have an alternate function, such as holding down shift and pressing scale will put you in the scale edit mode. Arp becomes arp edit, undo becomes redo, play becomes restart, and record becomes count in. If we move to the right and we move our hand from the back of the keyboard to the front, we find that we have two square buttons that are side by side, a space, a long button, below that another long button, and below that another set of square buttons that are side by side. These buttons are mute, solo, preset up, preset down, face left, 
Fade light. The mutant solo are pretty self-explanatory. They will mute in solo whatever track you're pointing to in the DAW. Preset up and preset down are also self-explanatory. They will go to the previous and next presets respectively, in complete control. Page left and page right cycle between the previous and next eight parameters assigned to the knobs. For example, if you load something up in massive, the first thing you'll see is the eight macros. Depending on which massive patch you loaded, you might see parameters such as effects, reverb, delay, chorus, glide, stuff like that. By going to the next page, you can dig a little deeper and customize your sound even further. For example, go five pages into a Monarch patch and you will be able to start customizing the OSC parameters of that patch. Remember, there's only eight encoder knobs, but way more than eight parameters in some cases. FM8 is notorious for this. I've counted at least 10 pages, but it's well worth it in the end because you do get access to the effects and the parameters for each effect. If we move to the right, we find a set of five buttons. These go from the back of the keyboard to the front. These, however, only apply to the machine workflow, but they are... Scene. Pattern. Track. Keyboard. Clear. To the right of that, you feel a screen. In actuality, it's two screens. Along the top, you'll feel what we call the F keys. And along the bottom, you'll feel the eight encoder knobs. As I stated earlier, the F keys are context sensitive. I can click through all of them, and the only ones that are going to give me spoken feedback are five, six, and eight. Previous plugin, button, next plugin, button active. Quick browse, button active. The reason for this is because we are in plugin view with nothing loaded. So if I turn training mode off, training mode off. Go into the browser. Browser. And now turn it back on. Training mode on. And now if I click through the buttons here. Previous content type, button active. Next content type. Quick browse, button active. Preset collection, factory. Previous plugin, button active. Next plugin, button active. Filter by favorites, off. Now we have spoken feedback on all eight buttons. And of course, if I hold shift down, shift. Sort by categories. Sort by vendors. Three doesn't do anything. Speed preset on. Five and six don't do anything. Set favorites off. Preview on. That's what we got. I've gone ahead and turned training mode off, went back to the plugin view, and turned training mode back on again, just how it was before, to finish up our tour of the buttons. To the right of the screen, we encounter another six pack of buttons here, grouped all by themselves, with a 4D encoder knob below that. These buttons are... Browser. Plugin. Mixer. Instance. MIDI. Setup. The 4D encoder does not give us any spoken feedback, but we can click it to the right, up, left, down, Turn it, it is to taunted. That's why it clicks. And we can click it in. Let's go ahead and turn training mode off. Training mode off. So, how do we actually load a patch? Unique to the S series keyboards, we actually use the eight encoder knobs to navigate through libraries and then filter our results by bank, subbank, type, subtype, and character. So, by default, the knobs from left to right are category, product, bank, subbank, type, subtype, character, and preset. Now here's an instance where the F keys come into play. F keys 1 and 2 flips between different content types, so by default when you bring up the browser it loads up the instrument type. If you hit F2 however you can switch to loops and if you hit it again you can switch to one shots. Hit F1 twice to get back to instruments. F4 cycles between your user library and your factory library. F7 filters by favorites and F8 loads your selected preset. So let's go ahead and load up a patch. I'm gonna go ahead and load up an e-piano from Contact. I specifically chose it for compatibility. Whether you have complete start or collectors, you should be able to follow along. So, knob two. Products, all products. And now we're gonna go ahead and scroll down to contact, and I'll probably cut most of this out because it is quite a long list. 40 very home, drums. 40 very home, Abbey Road 50 drummer, Abbey Road 6, Abbey Road 70, kinetic toys. All right, we're getting close. Defondo, Defondo, contact. There we go, we're in contact. Now, we'll go ahead and use knob three. Band, all banks. To filter to band. Acoustic. Band. Now we're going to use knob four to filter down to electric pianos. Sub band, all sub bands. One, four, two, acoustic pianos, three, electric pianos. Now we could just jump to knob eight, so let's go ahead and do that. Reset, clap it. Clap it, auto wallet. Clap it, stereo, auto wallet. Clap it, auto wallet. Mark my classic. Mark my crunchy expressive. Mark my rhythm. Mark my crunchy expressive. Mark my classic. Let's go ahead and pick that. We can either hit F8 to load the preset or click into the 4D encoder here. Preset Mark Classic. We have sound. So how does it feel to play? Well, I'll go ahead and play you guys a short passage here. It's 
one of those things is you have to kind of get used to playing on semi-weighted keys if you're not used to playing on them. So for something like this that's sensitive, I find that you kind of have to press a little harder than you mean to. Maybe I'm just a lighter player. But it's just one of those things you eventually get used to. If anything, you can always adjust the velocity slider in your DAW to compensate. On a side note, having known an MK1, I really do miss having those touch strips, as you were able to customize them. For instance, the pitch strip would let you adjust how fast it would move, if you were to suddenly put your finger on it. I always kept it at maximum, but it was nice that you had that choice. The mod strip had interesting parameters. Aside from being able to use it regularly, there was a couple different modes you could set it to. There was a spring mode, where if you put your finger in the middle of the mod strip, it would jump to that position, but then it would spring back down if you let it go. This did have a strength setting as well. The higher the value, the faster it would spring back down to the default position. There was also a ball mode as well. This is where things got interesting. Essentially, this mode simulated a ball. Put your finger anywhere on the mod strip, and the ball would roll towards it. There was a friction setting that would dictate how fast the ball would stop moving after you removed your finger. There was also a gravity setting that would dictate how fast the ball would move. There was also a tempo setting that would let you do all this to a beat. And finally, there was a wall setting. You could set range limits, and if this was on, the ball would bounce between them. If it was off, it would continue in the same direction, restarting on the other side of the range limit. You were also able to throw the ball as well, making for some very interesting modulations. And finally, you had a step mode. In this mode, your strip was split into 2-5 to five sections, and you also had a division setting as well. So while I do miss the touch strips, I don't miss having to be connected to AC power. Now for the A-series keyboard. I'll go ahead and give you guys a description, and then we'll do the same thing we did with the other one. Load up that same E-piano, and I'll try to play the same passage that I just did. Not too much going on on the rear panel. You have a USB-B standard for bus power, a quarter inch sustain pedal jack, and a Kensington lock slot. And on the top of the unit, same deal. We have buttons arranged in the groups, and they sound like this. They are louder and clackier. To turn on accessibility mode on these keyboards, we hold shift and then hit the ideas button. Shift per usual is on the upper left hand side of the keyboard and in that same group of six buttons, ideas is a third button on that second row. Let's go ahead and turn accessibility on. Once again, it didn't speak on the recording, but for me, it said accessibility on. As before, we can invoke training mode by pressing shift twice. Training mode on. These two groups of six buttons are arranged exactly the same as they are on the S series and the M series. Three across and two down. So what I'm going to do is press all 12 of them so you can hear what they are. Shift. Scale. Arc. Undo. Quantize. Ideas. Loop. Metronome. Tempo. Play. Record. Stop. You might be wondering what happened to the automation key. Because we use shift ideas to turn accessibility on and off, automation got mapped to shift quantize. So just as before, holding down shift gives us alternate functions. Shift scale is scale edit. Shift arp is arp edit. Shift undo is redo. Shift quantize is automation. Shift ideas is accessibility toggle. Shift play is restart. Shift record is count in. And shift stop is clear. If we move to the right, you'll feel a little plastic window. That's a screen. It only displays very basic information such as the patch name or the parameter that you're adjusting. Below that is a long button, below that is another long button, and below that are two square buttons side by side. The button closest to the screen is preset up, the button below that is preset down, and the two square buttons side by side, the left one is page left, and the right one is page right. If you hold shift and press preset up, that toggles speak preset on and off. If you hold shift and press page left, you'll mute the current track. If you hold shift and press page right, you'll solo the current track. To the right of this group of buttons is your 8 encoder knobs. To the right of that, you'll run to a row of 3 buttons, and below that the 40 encoder knob. Same deal as before, to taunted wheel, you can turn it, click it in, move it up and down, Previous plugin. Next plugin. left and right. The row of 3 buttons are, Browser. Plugin. Track. holding the shift button, plugin and track become MIDI and instance respectively. Browse is not affected. Below that of course is your keybed. On the left hand side, mod and pitch wheels, with octave buttons above them. Another difference is that if you hold shift, they don't adjust per semitone anymore. Instead, shift octave down is fixed velocity, and shift octave up is key mode. Some of this stuff has to do with machine, but that is beyond the scope of this video. So let's go ahead and turn training mode off, training mode off. and find that EPR that we did earlier. Browsing and filtering on here is a little different. We don't use the 8 encoder knobs to do so. Instead, we use the 4D encoder. Turn the wheel left and right to scroll and point to something on the list. Moving the encoder left and right takes you to previous and next section respectively, and click in to select. So I'll go ahead and hit browse. Browser file types instruments. 
and now we're in our content types. Loops. One shots. Loops. Instruments. So now we click right. Product all. And now we can find contact. Instead of scrolling through all those though, I can hold down shift and move by 20 items. Shift. Add your old modern number. Action screen 2. LED Scanlin. EX underscore Opera Austin. Create series. Kalimba. East Asia. Devolve R2. Ordinary Violin. India. Shift. Low by low. I have let go of the shift key as we're pretty close, so now we'll turn the encoder wheel a couple clicks back to go a couple libraries up. Counter. Contact. There we go. Now we click right. Type all. And now we don't have banks. So, I'm going to go ahead and sort by piano and keys. So I'll go ahead and hold shift again. Shift. Metal instruments. And that gets us pretty close, so I let go. Organ. Percussion. Piano slash keys. There we go. Now I'm going to click right again. Subtypes all. And I want electric. Clavinet. Digital piano. Electric piano. There we go. Characters all. Characters all is fine. Results by classic. And there's the patch that we had. Mark crunchy expressive. Mark classic. Now we just click in to select. And now... We have sound. Now I'll try to play the same passage. Because this is a synth action keybed, I don't feel like I have to press as hard to get the higher velocities. That's just the nature of the beast though. The difference lies in the feel of the keys. While synth action is easier to play, I think I personally prefer the semi-weighted keys of the S series. And finally the M series. Since the button layout is exactly like the A series, I'm not going to bother describing it again. I will however show you the clackiness of the keys. They aren't as loud as the A series due to this keyboard having a significantly smaller body. So let's go ahead and try to play that passage again with a slight modification this time. For how inexpensive this keyboard is, the keys actually feel really good to play on. Each of the series do. This almost feels toyish, but at the same time it doesn't. These keys do have a little bit of resistance to them. And I do feel I don't need to strain as hard to get those higher velocities either. At the end of the day, what matters the most is what you feel most comfortable playing on. Whether it's the semi-weighted bit of an S series, or the synth action feel of the A or M series, only you can make that decision. What are your needs? What do you feel would best fit your workflow? I hope this has been of some use to you. My goal was to give you an idea of what each of the series entailed, feature-wise and playability-wise, so I sincerely hope this has helped you in some way. For all the latest information on any of these products, please visit www.native-instruments.com. Good luck on your next musical investment, and happy keyboarding. I'll let the M32 take us out. Thank mm -hmm. you.